So I want to introduce Sue Darling Sullivan. So she's got over 30 years of nonprofit management experience and Sue has worn many hats within organizations focused on growth, innovation, community impact, transformative strategic planning and best practice governance. And through it all, effective communications have always played a critical role. She's got a degree at Mount Holyoke College and Dartmouth's Tuck School of Business. Sue's enjoyed working at a diverse range of nonprofits, including the Harvard University, the Boston Lyric Opera, the USS Constitution Museum, and the Box Center, uh, the Wang Center in Boston, where she developed Art Week, which was originally a local community and outreach initiative. And she took that Art Week into an award-winning statewide arts festival that celebrated in 170 Massachusetts communities. So she joined the Barnstable Land Trust team in 2021 as a part-time director of communications, where she continues to wear many hats, including as a champion of a new regional collaborative program called First Day Hike Cape Cod. So Sue, we'll let you take it off and uh, run the slides from your, your computer and look forward to learning from you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Cynthia, for that introduction. Let's bear with me as we I uh, attempt to overcome my techno peasant nickname. Um, so, hopefully, does everybody see the screen with this the slides? Yes. Yeah. Right. Yep. We got okay. it. Excellent. Well, thank you again to all of you who have returned after dinner um, and are still game to watch and be part of another workshop, uh, uh, or as I call it, the uh, late night show portion of the Massland Conference. Um, my goal is to make sure it goes fairly quickly and is um, engaging. I will cover some general concepts first of how I envision 360 communications, but I will spend more time on examples of how BLT has uh, kicked off a communication strategy that I think is of uh, portions are doable by every land trust, no matter what your size or resources are. And then afterwards, I wanna make sure that there's still plenty of time for questions um, before the bewitching hour. So I will get started. Um, so what is a 360 communication strategy? I included the textbook description here um, just so that you would all have it, but really in simple terms, it's just a comprehensive communication strategy. I remember when I was um, being interviewed for a new position at BLT, as you heard, um, which I started in really early August um, as a part-timer, that communications really touches all parts of an organization if it's used effectively. Some of the key elements is that consistency of messaging helps growth for the organization and for its goals that using multimedia and multi-channel distribution aspects helps to branch out and reach new people, that it expands your reach, a root system, and that um, the best part, I think, is that creativity thrives in this environment. So there's a lot of great opportunity to translate your message into different uh, concepts. What is a 360 approach? Why is it important? I think it really helps to create focus. Um, and because there's a lot of different possibilities and messages, but it helps you hone in on a few different messages that are important to your organization and the work that you're doing. And it reinforces those key messages across different platforms and to key audiences. That helps you expand your impact um, and Frankly, it improves efficiency. You're not recreating the wheel every time on thinking about what are you trying to say or why are you trying to say it? Uh, especially when, you know, nonprofits, small nonprofits are often, you know, have the challenges of no time, no money and no staff. Um, that really helps make every effort uh, go the extra mile. 
ultimately a good communication strategy helps build your brand recognition, your mission awareness, and encourages community engagement at a lot of different levels. There are lots and lots of tools that you can use in your communication strategy. I tried to outline a few of those that we either are using or are hoping to use. Some that you can control the message, like a website, social media, print campaigns, et cetera. Others where it allows you to get your message out um, through press, through fundraising campaigns, through sponsorships and partnerships, speaking engagements, um, and allows you to you know, reach different audiences with the same messages, like government officials, your local uh, government officials, or even your internal audiences, which are board, staff, volunteers. So who do you want to reach? Um, the list is long, um, and this is just a sample of what some of you or who some of you are trying to reach. It could be the general public, it could be members, board members, donors, staff, business community, press funders, um, young professionals, families, retirees, the list goes on. The goal is to right size it for your organization and for you to look at all the people you wanna reach and who's the most important. The reason I love a sort of a 360 integrated communication strategy is it's pretty simple. There's just two important parts. Pick your key messages and integrate them extensively using whatever tools are at your, um, at your hand. So, um, and you'll hear more about how BLT, how we are trying to do that at BLT, but really it's pick the messages and then share them consistently across platforms to reach a lot of different people. So another, a few other things to consider as you're building your strategy. One is setting the path. What are your goals? I only included a few examples here because I know every organization, again, has um, different goals, but examples might be to build awareness in the community, to grow you know, members and donors, increase the kind and extent of partnerships, uh, you might be fundraising for a special project or property, or you may want to just try to recruit a more diverse or um, extensive board. Um, I also have worked in other lives using the balanced scorecard and strategy maps to um, define strategy. It's a concept used mostly in Fortune 500, but effectively does translate to nonprofits. And one of the core tenets of that is how will you measure success? What does success look like? And you should take some time to think about that when you're thinking about your communication strategy. Like, does it mean you're in the press more often? Are your e-blasts working more effectively? Are people opening them? Are they interacting with them? Do you have more social followers, social media followers? Or if you're looking at sponsorships and partnerships, are you looking at, you know, building the value of their in-kind contributions or the value of their, their financial contributions? Maybe you're looking at a campaign and saying, are we raising, how much money are we raising? Are donors engaged? How many new members are we tracking? And how many old members are we keeping? Or maybe it's something as simple, are we building the diversity we of our board. So it really, this, your communication strategy can be right sized to whatever your goals and your success metrics are. One of the things that um, my executive director has said is how important it is to dedicate human resources. And um, the more I've been in the position, the more um, it's been interesting to know that you know, our organization has two full-time employees, an executive director and a land steward. And they're wearing so many hats. There's so much to do, as I know every single one of you can, um, can identify with, 
that there's not enough time necessarily to think about communications. You're focused on getting things done. But if you dedicate some kind of human resources to your communication strategy, they will be able to keep communications at the top of mind and be able to step back and say, okay, I know what you're doing, but how do we tell people about what is happening? So there's a couple of different ways you can do that. It can be in a dedicated staff position. Um, so like mine, it's a part-time director of communications, although I will say it, I have realized more and more how broad that job title is. <laughs> Not only is it communications, it's programming and a lot of other things, um, but there are other options too. You can hire a consultant to do communications who brings in an outside perspective. Um, I'm sure that um, many organizations have hidden talents in their volunteers who have come from a marketing, PR, or communications background. It might be a, developing a committee or reshaping a committee to focus on external and internal communications and community engagement efforts. It might be an advisory group that only meets a couple of times a year that you recruit that brings special talents to um, your organization. Again, professionals who are doing PR, marketing, and outreach. And lastly, one can't overlook the value of a good intern. Um, I would suggest at the college or um, past uh, postgrad level who have some experience in marketing, um, design other kinds of communication skills. But there are a lot of different ways to incorporate uh, talent to also um, make sure that there's some accountability for communications um, and somebody or some group who is putting communications at the top of their um, priorities. So I'm gonna go quickly from here into more examples, tangible examples, which I always think are um, are helpful in showing how organizations of all sizes and all resources can incorporate uh, communications into their work. So when I started at Barnstable Land Trust in August, I looked at several sources. One was the strategic plan. They had done a strategic planning process um, during the beginning of COVID. Um, and so there was a lot of important uh, priorities and messaging in that. I looked at work plans. I looked at annual meeting reports, talked extensively with um, the executive director, board members, staff, et cetera. And so three, and this is just represent, there's actually more messages, but three things really popped out that we try to build our communication strategy over. One is the mission, protect natural places people love for present and future generations. The strategic plan identified this great um, sentence, which I draw on a lot. Um, and the key words in the next statement is leader in collaborative, leader in collaborative land preservation and stewardship, leader in collaborative community engagement, training and advocacy. And that has helped shape in the early stages of our strategy, um, some important direction. And lastly, is the phrase, be the organization that our community needs. Now, Land Trust, you know, really experienced a, a surge in relevancy in the late 70s and 80s as a response to real urban development and suburban sprawl. And, you know, since then have been very successful in being local champions for land preservation and protection. I think we're back at a cycle here where um, the role of a land trust is evolving um, to be more than just about land acquisition and protection. It's being a voice about how climate change affects their mission. It it's includes environmental justice. It includes development plans. Um, and so a lot of the things that you'll see as we go through more examples it rests on be the organization that your community needs. So when I started, there were a few initiatives in place at different um, levels. So one thing that had just been completed was the Barnstable Trail Map, Guide Map. 
which you can see a small uh, photo of on the right. Um, now, this is the first uh, trail map of its kind. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, the Cape, the town of Barnstable is the Mid Cape, and it represents seven different villages, which include Hyannis, Catuit, Osterville, Marston Mills, Centerville, West Barnstable, and I know I'm missing somebody. I always do miss the seventh, but it's seven mini towns. Um, and the Barnesville trail map doesn't only represent our trails. It represents 34 different sites in the town across those seven villages and represents almost 95 hikeable mile, uh, trail miles. And so it's an incredible resource of when I had arrived, it had already been distributed to libraries and a uh, chamber of commerce and tourism sites. But I felt it was an opportunity for this particular project to become literally our calling card. It's something physical, it's something online, it's a resource that people love. Um, and we needed to talk more about it and to take credit for it. Um, Another initiative that will be more of a focus for this upcoming year is the barn at Fuller Farm. So Fuller Farm was a property we acquired in 2012. The initiative is to build an actual barn on the property. The donor's uh, desire, request was that the property honor um, the historic agricultural roots of the property, but also to help to educate people about where their food comes from. So that will be a primary component of our communication strategy this year. And then lastly, on the lower left, there's another property that's more of a neighborhood property rather than um, a sort of lots of hiking trails for the public uh, on Commerce Road in West Barnstable. And that will be a major uh, fundraising project for us this year. Internal communications, again, is something that um, our executive director has found particularly helpful where we've been able to make uh, an impact. And internal, I mean board to staff, staff to staff, staff to volunteers. One of the things that we've done is that um, we've looked carefully at positioning of the executive director. Um, you know, I felt it was a great opportunity to put a face to the organization and um, as the voice and local champion of who Barnstable Land Trust is and what our mission is. So we've spent some time and opportunity to give more visibility uh, to her as you will see in upcoming examples. Another thing that we did was a board meeting summary. So now before every board meeting, we create a, probably it's an average of a three page, two to three page bullet points by different categories, overview of what's happened um, from board meeting to board meeting. Previously, it had been focused mostly on committee work, but there's so much that happens in an organization beyond committees that were impacting both how resources were being used and strategic priorities. So for instance, the, the board summary included things about, um, we are currently in our second technology, major technology upgrade since I've been started in August. The first one was um, a shift to and an upgrade to Office 36, Microsoft Office 365 and to SharePoint. So moving more to a web-based system. And currently, we're also just completing an upgrade for our uh, fundraising uh, database in a major upgrade. But those two things related back to strategic priorities, right? Invest in the techno technological infrastructure. And it also impacted staff time, staff efficiency, how people were spending their time to learn these new systems, to implement these new systems. And it was important for the board to understand that those big initiatives were happening behind the scenes. Another thing that we've included in board summaries is, oh yeah, during uh, December or January, the boiler um, burst and the basement flooded. Again, a major implication on how um, work was getting done and diversions 
of uh, what the staff had to deal with. But beyond some of those things, we've also included links to all the press um, so that they have access to know the diversity and the placement and wherever we're getting press, be it about initiatives, be it about programs, or be it about other things related to the organization. So the board meeting summaries have really helped communicate about the organization as a whole. It's also enabled the board meetings to be more effective. The board can read all of these materials beforehand and then the level of the discussion at the board meeting itself incorporates those learnings, but is at a more strategic level. FAQs, um, so I wouldn't recommend doing these a lot, um, but for big, important topics, they can be very helpful. We're involved currently in a housing development project in Hyannis, where the um, where the organization where the largest parcel of open green space is, uh, which is a golf course, is being um, pursued by a developer for. 312 uh, housing units and 13 buildings, you know, four to 500 parking spaces, et cetera. Not only is it uh, a large, the largest in its area of uh, unprotected green space, but it's also with very fragile water systems, et cetera. It has been very controversial as many housing and uh, development projects are. Um, but we chose that um, we've become an environmental voice and champion to figure out the balance between housing and conservation efforts, recognizing how critical the housing needs are, but also encouraging people to think about how conservation and environmental efforts can be integrated into developments of this kind. It's a complicated issue, there's a lot of moving parts and it changes quickly. So we developed a two to three page uh, piece with frequently asked sort of key questions about why are we involved? What are the implications? What are our goals? What's the process? What's the feedback? Um, and updated that as the process has gone along and distributed that to both board and staff. The goal of that is that both your board and staff are your key champions and advocates and community spokespeople. So they should feel comfortable and confident in how they're answering questions or talking about very complicated issues like that. So um, we've updated it as the process has gone on, but uh, the board and staff have found it very helpful to clarify uh, the things that they wouldn't um, necessarily um, have thought about. Um, in between the board meetings, which we have bi-monthly, um, we have added, uh, the executive director will send out every few weeks, maybe a short bulleted email with more updates, just so that people feel are consistently updated and communicated with about things that are evolving um, in a very busy environment. Our goals are also to create fact sheets, to update our orientations for board, for volunteers and for staff, and also to integrate a more regular volunteer outreach e-newsletter. So here's another example where we've moved from e-blasts um, to e-news. So you can see the example, the before and after. Um, and one of the things that we changed in the redesign was to move our uh, the header to be our logo and our name. But more importantly, we've moved to a very photo intensive strategy. So you'll hear, you'll hear and see this throughout the presentation that I'm a picture is worth a thousand words kind of person. So um, you will see that on the right, there's a, you know, we're going for beauty photos, you know, high res, interesting, diverse photos. Um, we also redesigned it to be the typeface is cleaner, easier to read on a line, be it on your phone or your website. 
um, on a desktop, it's easier to scan. Um, and we've also engaged and created a new photography initiative with the local arts center who has a strong photo, photo classes, a you know, digital photography club, et cetera, as a year long partnership to encourage amateur, you know, accomplished amateur photographers to submit their photos on a regular basis to us on areas that we care about or are looking to develop more photos. We created a, a portion of our website that is more detailed in what kinds of photos we're looking for, you know, the technical things of uh, what kind of resolution, what kinds of categories, and that is really starting to bring in some great um, visual resources to our efforts. Um, the other thing we've done is commit to a very um, regular uh, schedule of every other week, same time, same day. Before the emails were going out somewhat regularly, um, but not always, um, and it depended on content. So now uh, people know to expect our e-news um, and we, we found that that's really helped with um, encouraging our open rates. But most importantly, we've looked at our content uh, previously. And I, I think in looking at um, some other land trusts, it tends to be very program centered. So it's an event centered e-blast, sign up for this. This is a great class. And there are lots of great classes, believe me. But we've really moved to adding more learning content, not just programs, some organizational content so that they can learn more about who we are, what we're doing. So we've increased the number of sections. They're shorter. Some is really, um, you know, I always feel if somebody can read our e-news and come away feeling a little bit smarter, then we've done our job. Um, the, the happy results of that are we've seen the results um, fairly quickly. Um, we have um, for the last month now climbed to over a 50% open rate and a really high click-through rate on um, much of our content. So we've heard a lot of feedback that people always, you know, it's a little bit of education, entertainment, um, and awareness built into each newsletter, um, e-news. And so I would urge you to look at that particular tool really um, carefully. So I said, we've looked at content um, carefully too. We've added more short video clips. Thank you very much. iPhone is a really helpful tool, although someday I hope to get to real video. But um, the examples that you're seeing here at the top with the, um, the dusk and um, birds was a 10 second video taken by our executive director at a viewing deck overlooking a property behind our offices. We have used it multiple times in social media and e-newsletter um, and it has garnered some great click throughs um, and is a perennial favorite. The image on the right is that we have, um, we launched, tried for the first time, an interactive sort of slideshow to music for our holiday email. And um, that was um, thanks to the talents of my colleague, the um, a young uh, part-time communications associate who has many more technical skills than I do. But that was a great sort of view of, of opportunity for us to engage people in doing um, a look back on what had happened over the year. And the bottom one is another short video, um, iPhone video. We did an e-news um, on burn piles and highlighted what the volunteers were doing. We did fun facts on why burn piles are important and we included a little video on why on actually being at a burn a burn pile. Um, I can't uh, talk enough about a picture's worth a thousand words, photos, photos, photos. We also added um, traditionally, not always, but have a short fun fact. Um, 
It might be about a plant or a, you know, a mushroom species or about the eclipse versus solstice. Uh, but it's always like one to two sentences where people can just scan. They're learning something that relates to our work. And again, they leave saying, who knew that? Um, we've also embraced technology um, and um, the QR code culture. So we added, we've added QR codes for our kiosk, for different campaigns. We've also done a QR code interactive hike on one of our um, trails, and we will be launching on Earth Day another uh, innovation on our trail signage for a new initiative called Words in the Wild, where people can read poems by local poets engraved on signs, and then they'll be able to link and hear those poets read their poems um, through audio, audio recordings. We've made an effort to start collecting more consistent statistics. Um, some people respond better to messaging through numbers, and the numbers can tell an important story. We've also started collecting what I call fan mail or quotes from people who might send, you know, put a message on social media or send us an email or call on a phone message, but it's great to be able to collect those and use those in your different, different communications vehicles. It could be the external stuff that we're doing, but also for grants and proposals. And lastly, we really have tried to, starting to develop more content through our community partners. We'll be adding more blogs by them, uh, photos and um, fun facts. So they can be a great contributor um, and it's a win-win for both of you. So programming also falls into my um, bailiwick. So we've looked at that Two, it takes a lot of effort and resources, as you all know, to run programs. We've looked at more collaborative efforts, um, including that in the first few months that I was there, I happened to meet a very um, forward-thinking colleague, and she and I decided to co-lead a group of um, uh, from the conservation community of people involved in communications and community engagement efforts that those kinds of groups already existed with executive directors and land stewards. And so we thought there, there made a lot of sense there. So, um, so we meet bi-monthly, we uh, share information, we learn from each other about everything from youth and education programs to press outreach to uh, communications efforts. But we also, even though we started in October by November, um, uh, we took, BLT took the lead um, in launching a new collaborative programming effort, a regional collaborative programming effort, um, based on and inspired by the first day hikes programs, which are run by state parks nationwide on January 1st. We um, uh, did a first day hikes Cape Cod version, and um, they were free hikes and activities offered on January 1st. And the, you know, we were lucky to get 11 different programs through eight different communities. Um, we got some great press out of it, but we also, most programs were sold out, even though they were free. They were filled to capacity. Some people added additional programs and overall the effort attracted over 400 people across the Cape. We'll be repeating the effort this um, June through a cel Celebrate the Solstice um, a kind of program. So, um, you know, a rising tide, I have to be careful when I say this, a rising tide lifts all boats, but I meant a rising tide naturally lifts all boats. So working together can have great impacts. We've increased our partner programs and events. The photo on the right is a Example of an art museum who did a, a special exhibit, which included a muralist who did a environmentally inspired mural of a fallen tree. The art uh, museum did panels um, that linked back to environmental concerns, made BLT one of their partners. We did joint board events, et cetera. It was a win-win on both um, sides. 
We've started um, for our trail hikes and programs to take always take a group photo at the end. You can see the group photo in front of you that was taken from our sunrise first day hike on January 1st, just before the rain started. And then we share that with um, the attendees as a thank you after they have come. I sort of take this as a page from the uh, Disney World um, sort of page of, you know, when you go down those water slides and your you're hands up and you're like, ah, and you're, you know, getting drowned from the waves. Um, but you always, but you buy the photo and you're like, oh, remember the good times. Um, this is actually the better version of this. And people love getting these photos and saying, I had such a great time. Thank you for sharing this. Um, so it's a nice little touch, not hard to do, and a great reason to circle back to some of the people who are involved in your programs. We also are targeting new audiences. We've mostly targeted an adult audience, our first day hikes, um, allowed us to also launch a program targeting families. Uh, we didn't know what to expect. We made it a drop by from 11 to one at our headquarters. We created some family games. It rained, of course, a nice steady drizzle. And yet, um, so we thought, ah, we'll get 25 people. Um, to our shock and surprise, we had 125 people. And part of that is because of the programming, but part of it is also how we communicated about it. And most of the people who came said they learned about it through Facebook events and Instagram. Whereas most of our other uh, communications have come from an older population have come from our e-news blast. So it just goes to show that how you're communicating to different audiences makes a difference. And that's why you wanna send the same message across multiple channels to appeal to different audiences. We've diversified the kinds of programs we're doing. In addition to walks and talks, we're doing more partnership programs, um, you know, with libraries and other nonprofits, and that is proving to attract more and more new people too. But we're also talking about it. Um, so, uh, you know, the big takeaway here is whatever you're doing, you should talk about more so that people know um, what is happening and can get excited about it. And lastly, we do a lot of pre and post um, uh, conversations about events, even if they're sold out. Um, we want people to know about what the quality of the events and the programs that we're offering and to also offer a little education about them, even if they weren't able to attend. Another example is our annual newsletter. It was one of the big projects that um, I inherited. Um, it's the biggest print project that comes out of the organization every fall. You can see the uh, before and after pictures. So we did do some significant shifts in how we um, approached the annual newsletter. We changed the cover to an one photo um, sort of uh, that had significance and you can see the Making a Difference um, title reinforces one of our key messages. Um, so that was a big shift. Inside, we went to more photo heavy for our either our properties or the nature that we're protecting or people on experiencing and enjoying um, our trails. So we made the copy a little more succinct rather than copy heavy. We made the you know, design easier to read, better scan value. We added some sections of stats. Um, but most importantly, going back to the strategy of the executive director positioning as being the voice of an organization, the personal voice, we added a full page letter and photo by the executive director. Believe it or not, we actually got fan mail back saying how um, nice it was to read and hear about um, what the organization was doing from the leadership of the organization. And we made sure it was a very compelling letter. And we added a, a highlight of why support uh, traditionally had been more about what had happened um, and what the organization had accomplished as a lead up to the annual uh, uh, campaign, fundraising campaign. But we also added like, a section that said, this is why 
Your support through membership and contributions helps make a difference in us being able to achieve and to um, accomplish the things that you're reading about. And lastly, a simple change was we went to an uncoded stock. It just feels more natural and consistent with what the organization was about. The, um, the, the impact of this was that we actually raised more money directly as a result of the annual newsletter this year. And I'm gonna backtrack a little to the e-news um, thing that we also have increased a lot of our readership um, and open rates by hundreds of people who are reading our, um, our newsletters. So these things all contribute and build to um, an increased impact, which also led to our annual appeal campaign. So we decided that after the, the newsletter, that we would expand and create sort of a more deliberative um, annual appeal campaign. We created a campaign called Tis the Season, and we repeated several key messages as part of that. We redesigned the annual appeal e-blast, which you can see the screenshot of what it looks like on a mobile phone, heavier on photos. I know, are you tired of hearing that message? And uh, carefully crafted messages. Um, we made that three different ones. So it was a six week campaign. We had three just dedicated annual appeal messages and we integrated three annual appeal messages into the already scheduled bi-monthly e-newsletters. We added a poster campaign in our kiosk, which included a QR code that tied into the tis the season. And we created a weekly social media campaign, as you can see, photo heavy and reinforcing um, six different messages that we wanted to reinforce, like a local conservation champion, protecting natural resources, and lastly, we added a six week banner campaign on our website to reinforce all these different components. The good news is, is that the annual appeal campaign actually exceeded the goals that were set for this year. Um, and um, we were really excited by the results. Press, oh press. Um, so we have, um, actually have been lucky enough um, because press is somewhat about strategy and somewhat about luck, been gotten front page articles three times in the Cape Cod Times over the last few months. The one on the left you can see relates back to the Twin Brooks campaign that I talked about, about the housing development um, initiative that we're very involved in. Um, and the one on the right was about the uh, Fresh Air Start was about the collaborative effort that we led for um, the first day hikes Cape Cod. And so we were featured as a leader in developing that concept. And as I look at press, I want us to get uh, acknowledgement not only for issue-oriented things, but about our programs and about our mission. So some of the strategies that we used there was to look at your press release and the boilerplate at the end. So you probably have a, a mission statement. We expanded that to include many of the messages that were outlined in the um, in the first few slides. So I've included some of those and also done links to talk about our trail maps, which is a great community resource. Each press release includes a quote from the executive director or the board chair, again, putting a personal spin on what our organization is about. We include photos wherever we can. Press like um, Cape Cod Times has their own photographers. They like to showcase that, but on the other hand, for a local newspaper, we included a iPhone photo for one of our hikes and it got a half page um, coverage, which I'll take. Um, consistently, we're trying to position the executive director as a key voice of the organization. And um, after the press outreach, May outreach through me, putting um, the ED um, in direct contact with the press and then 
giving them constant uh, contact helps develop relate relationships and access as they're um, building more and more. So we're we've become more of a go to because um, many of the press feel that they have a relationship with the executive director and have easy access to her. We've expanded our outreach to include columnists, radio, op-ed, social media, all kinds of different, um, we define press as very broad. We share and post a lot on social media to increase um, the awareness. And upon occasion, if we know that a press person is reaching out for some kind of quote or interview or something, it helps sometimes to review and rehearse the messaging. Not that um, the executive director doesn't know them, but sometimes there's so much going on, it's a good like little refresher to um, make sure that it comes um, pretty easily. So um, I just, here's a few points if you're, you know, depending on where you are in your communications journey, um, I would say suggest on two to five key organizational messages, look at the tools that make the best fit for you and your organization and pick them to, um, to implement and to uh, get the messages out. Brainstorm content ideas that support the messages. Develop a timeline doesn't have to be very, it should be very flexible because gosh knows everything changes, but maybe three, maybe six months um, to give yourself some benchmarks. Implement, implement, implement. This is the fatal flaw. There, uh, you know, uh, I'm putting my strategic planning hat on, but many people have great plans and they fail to implement. So whether it's through volunteers, through staff, through um, however it is, just make sure that you're implementing and rolling out what your plan was. Um, and um, then be prepared to test. Engage others. You don't need to do it alone. Um, I always say the more the merrier um, who have, are familiar with the messaging and um, also sharing your message. Assess, evaluate, adjust, and then Go back and start again. Maybe expand what tools you're using. Expand the number of messages it, that you're trying to reinforce. But you can start small and let it grow. And lastly, some final thoughts. Again, repeat key messages. Stick, stick to the um, things that you're, you know are important to say. And then share it consistently to other stakeholders, however those communication tools are. Just always try to remember to reinforce what you're saying and to who you're saying it to. Dedicate resources, whether it's um, human resources, whether it's, you know, my dream is to actually have some budgetary resources. <laughs> but um, I think if you dedicate some kind of commitment and accountability, you'll see some kind of results. Develop your tools. If you just have a few in your toolkit, figure out how to grow the toolbox um, because it does different people respond to different tools. You've heard me say it again. I'll say it one last time. A picture tells a thousand words. Invest in your visuals, whether it's photography, video, or graphics. Basic technical resources are a plus. Um, take it from me, I worked from Apple Computer for a three month internship in the 80s, and my nickname was called Techno Peasant. So um, I realize and know the value of people who are comfortable with the technology on a very simple basis. I mean, um, I didn't know constant contact before, and now I do. Um, but you know, keeping a presence on things like Facebook and Instagram can be important to sharing your message. Leverage your partnerships, make it a win-win game, promote them and they can promote you. So they can help expand and amplify your message if you've had the right kind of conversations, set the expectations and also make sure that you're making it mutually beneficial. And last, have fun, get creative. Communications is a great opportunity to um, explore your creative side. So um, I think you can, there's, we have a lot of serious messages that are important for land trust to convey, but don't underestimate the um, 
the value of being creative in how you're reaching people who like to receive their information differently. And so, so on that note, I'm going to say thank you very much for um, hanging in there on the after dinner uh, session. And um, I will hand it back to Cynthia and open it up for questions. Great, thank you so much, Sue. Do you wanna stop share and? Yes. We can go there. I know there are a few questions in the chat box. Okay. Perfect. Um, so here's a question about the quotes and how you get permission for use of quotes um, and also for the photo initiative. You know, where, how did you do the permissions component of all of that? So you can go on our website under, I don't know, maybe, I can't remember what section of our website, but we um, developed the photo page to have all kinds of permissions and technical things and how to get permissions from people in the photos and how to get permissions from the artist to use the photos. Um, and in fact, we've added to our program registrations that once you register, you're giving permission for us to use the photos from the program. Um, and for quotes the same way. Um, and usually when we're using quotes, we'll probably use a first name and a last initial. So to preserve the privacy for people who are submitting those. Okay, great. And then there was a question going back to the um, conversation about the board meeting summary. Yeah. So is that, um, is that something that the ED gives to the board that highlights the key things going on? That was the, or was that the piece that included all of the details of what had happened? And, and part of that was because your, your board's meeting bi-monthly, correct? Right, so the board form, the big board meetings happen every other month. The board summary is, you know, um, sourced by members of the team. I probably generate 50%, maybe Lance Stewart generates more, the development person generates some other, Janet, the ED generates some. Um, so that is like a written three page bullet point kinds of things. And, you know, I think there's some natural categories about organizational, you know, programs, press, things that maybe committees aren't gonna go into that, the committee reports aren't gonna go into that level of detail. You don't wanna make it too long because board people won't read it, um, but you wanna make it comprehensive to show all the different areas that the organization is um, active in. The, the board, then she also sends highlights, but I would say it's an e-blast, an email with, I don't know, that you could read in five minutes that has bullet points in between. So you might say, oh, guess what? You know, we've had this happen and this and this. You might report it, repeat it in the board summary, but it keeps people consistently updated in between the board meeting summary, which is a little more formal. Okay, okay. great. And, and uh, so the next question's from Steven, just talking about impressive and all the work that you're doing and wondering what kind of projects uh, has BLT brought in outside communications consultants for, if any, and then, um, and then also wondering about the template that, you, that you've used for your e-news. Was that done in-house or was that a you know, canned so, um, contact format? Yeah. My position was actually created, first it was created as a potential consultant position. Um, and then, and that's actually how it was posted as you could be a consultant or you could be a part-time staff person. So um, I think it depends on what you're looking for and it depends on the person. Um, so I'm essentially the outside consultant who is really, who is a staff person. I'm not a consultant, I'm a part-time staff person, but they thought about whether you could do a consultant and sometimes they can be very effective. Um, but they brought, they decided, BLT decided to bring the function in-house. 
Um, we do occasionally use graphic designers with more extensive um, experience than our um, young communications assistants. So for like the annual newsletter, that's a fairly complicated design project. So we do bring in um, an outside designer for that, but otherwise everything's done in house. And the template for the e-news, God bless, you know, constant contact. I mean, apparently the original format was done years ago by a designer. But again, um, once the, the communications associate that I have was able to create the, you know, the new sort of look and, you know, it's, it wasn't huge. I mean, people could do it in house. Constant contact, apparently, if you know, <laughs> if you have the time to explore what it can do, you could create the same template. And the nice thing is things like that, they already have a lot of templates in house. So, I mean, in, as a resource, um, we've just created a temp, the template for um, this PowerPoint. Um, we just created in-house so that we would have some consistency for BLT, for colors that relate back to our logo, et cetera. So it's not, you know, it's not hard it, and you can do it with your existing resources. You don't need to bring in somebody outside. I had a call a couple of months ago from a, a land trust in Pittsburgh, a random call, um, who was, he was a board member and he was like, I'm supposed to call different places about social media and you guys are doing some stuff on social media. Um, so why do you think it's important? And I was like, well, um, I think it is important, but not, and they were gonna hire a consultant just for social media. And so my advice to him was don't think of social media as the silver bullet, it's not. It's part of a bigger toolkit. And again, different people, especially in this day and age, get their communications differently. I talked to a new colleague in the conservation community on the Cape only earlier this week. And here I'm like, woohoo, we've had great press coverage. I mean, how many front page stories can you get? And she was like, I don't really read the papers. So tell me what's happening. So it just reinforces that you have to be in multiple places repeating the same message because people are getting their information in a lot of different ways. Very, very true. And I, I have a, uh, a question for you myself because we went through the whole uh, monthly e-news. Do you do a monthly e-news or, and not overwhelm people's email boxes? Or, and, and we were told to switch from that, that we should for every event or for every piece of information that we have, we should send a separate short, very short visually, you know, include pictures, you know, I got the picture piece of it, um, but do more repeated messaging so that people were getting messages from these, from my land trust multiple times a week. I'd be curious to hear what your reaction to that is. Wow, multiple times a week, that's a lot. Um, so obviously, I mean, you can see the strategy that we went to was, you know, let's time and be proactive. We send ours out, you know, every two weeks. It's like clockwork. And, you know, sometimes I'm sitting on that constant contact, looking at the metrics and I'm like, wow, people are like sitting there reading their newsletter. They're, they're like, it's the time. Um, and they're reading it. So we're just more careful about how we plan what messages are going out. And I think people, you know, one of my board members said, oh, you're sending out e-news every week. I'm like, no, we're not. It's every two weeks. We're not trying to overwhelm you. But we do plan. I spend, you know, a, a certain amount of time in saying, what kind of messages do I want in you know, the mid-May, I mean, I'm already, I have, well, it's probably only one of the few things I'm on top of is I have folders now for every one of those e-blasts and I'm putting notes about what I need to cover on some of those that are looking out so that I don't forget what's timely. You know, it might be the barn at Fuller Farm 
It might be the equinox. It might be National Volunteer Month. Um, so there's a lot of things to keep in mind, but I feel it helps me be more strategic and the organization and what we're talking about. That's not to say that, and then we fill in the, the sort of time sensitive stuff on social media and then in, repeat it in our news things. But, um, but so far, I'm, it seems like the strategy has really paid off. I mean, the fact that we have grown the people who are actually reading the newsletters by several hundred people in a few months is, is really encouraging. Great. Thank you for responding to that. I am not seeing any new particular questions right now. Does anybody else have other questions for Sue about communications? You can un unmute your microphone and ask them directly if you'd like. Robin, yes, please. Yeah, hi, thanks, Cynthia. Sue, that was such a wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, I, uh, I'm a brand new executive director at the Williamstown Rural Lands out here in Western Congratulations. Mass. Thank you. Exactly. I spent my junior year there, so oh. I know it well. Okay. We were just singing the praises of the Clark Museum before we oh. got online here, so. Oh, lovely. Yeah, wonderful place. I'm, I'm, I'm honored to, to take this position. Now, we um, don't have a communication specialist on staff or even, I think, on the board. I'm not sure. Anyway, I, I watch this and I think, well, I know how to do some of these things, but I think I have to manage the organization. So my question really is, you know, should we get somebody so, to do I mean, this I for think us? that's one of the things that our executive director realized. She, she sort of has the right instinct. She sort of knows, right? But you're running yeah. an organization. Like, yeah. who has time to do that? Yeah. So, you know, and who, not every organization is going to have the resources to even hire a part time person, et cetera. Um, so my advice, one strategy that I used in another nonprofit when I had no, another nonprofit I had no resources for, is um, we first started, it was actually relating to HR. And so we recruited an HR advisory task force and we said, you only have to meet three times a year, we'll feed you lunch, here, help us do this kind of stuff. And we pulled HR executives from incredible places who are like, okay, I can spare two hours, you know, a total of six hours a, a year. Um, and of course, the more they learned, the more helpful they were. And they helped us, they were incredibly helpful in providing templates and advice and introducing people to us to help get the, the job done. I mean, the nice thing is where you're located, there might be some other organizations where you can create internships or fellowships, um, unpaid or stipend based to serve for, you know, three to six months um, to help focus on that particular part. It's not that it's necessarily brain surgery. It's just that who has the time to keep this at the top of mind. Um, and yet, Hopefully, at the end of the day, there's a return on investment in having some dedicated resources. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah, that is, that is. And I think, I, I also feel like it's so urgent, but, you know, this could be a six-month, one-year uh, project. Yeah. Or would you say do it incrementally, like hit the messages and start with that? I think I, ideally, I'd look at it as an ongoing kind of thing, because it all builds upon itself. I mean, that's really the magic of communications is it should build a foundation for all parts of the organization over time. You know, when I started um, sort of in, well, years ago, I started in um, uh, the museum world, right? In the early eighties as director of community relationships. That's because museums in the 80s had, there was no marketing, communications, PR staff positions. Um, it was all about community relations. 
Um, one of the board members came from an ad agency, so he was very forward thinking about the role that communications could play. At the same time, though, museums were building um, and recognizing how impactful communications marketing and PR could be because it was the beginning of blockbuster marketing for museums, right? It was the King Tut exhibit. There's great books about like, people are like, wow, uh, we had no idea packaging and pre presentation could actually have an impact on not only our mission, but on our bottom line. And today you would be hard put not to find some museum, some li many libraries have communications people. I mean, the value that the return on investment, even in you know a six to twelve month period, can be um, really significant. And in today's world, with so many competing people looking for to share their communications, um, it it can be a really valuable investment, capacity um, building investment. In, in many ways, communications uh, really uh, can also focus on your fundraising, right? I mean, that's key to being successful. So, you know, Absolutely. oftentimes as small land trusts, we think about, oh, well, we need to help doing the fundraising. Well, maybe it's you know, it's, it's communications and knowing that the messaging is clear and that you're targeting that so that you will be successful when you do your annual appeals or your membership drives. and Right. And we've got some things. new grant, you know, new donations from new people. Can we say it's because of X, Y, Z? No, but we know that the increase in the communication strategy, again, across multiple platforms, be it the press, be it our e-news, has um, garnered some new um, fundraising uh, gifts and success. So can I just ask you, how, uh, what's the population of Barnstable? And then what's, what kind of scale are you in terms of people that are, are connecting with Barnstable Land Trust? I mean, if, how, how big of an area, how many people actually live in the community and in terms of how many you're capturing? Um, I think there's still great potential um, on reaching the audience. We're a very seasonal population, no uh, surprise. Yeah, okay. okay. Um, and um, it's becoming a more diverse um, population of extremes. You know, there's locals versus seasonals, average, you know, I think, I don't know, town and country, somebody named you know, Barnstable as one of the most uh, highest priced luxury housing markets there is, which is hard to believe. Um, so it's it's a very diverse um, population um, and not always year round. So um, I think our goal is, I think we have a lot of opportunity and what we can do, but limited resources, right? So. Um, the fundraising campaigns have been more targeted on um, certain individuals who might um, more quickly align with the value of conservation. Part of my efforts, though, are to engage um, a more general public who are here year round. So let's say families with kids, um, youth um, activists, um, uh, government officials, I mean, Again, there's so much potential and it's a small organization. So um, we're just trying, we're not so scientific in that we're, our strategy is only hitting one. We're just scientific in what strategies we're using to hit some key targets that is important to us in reaching out. Thank you. So my computer says 812, you know, technically we're done at 815, but we can be done sooner if there are no other questions or soon. And my email's at the end of the um, presentation. Um, so if you go back and watch the recording, feel free to reach out. And it's, it's easy to find me on our website, um, which also needs a lot of work in our communication strategies. So don't be judgmental. Um, but it's at sue at blt.com, can't, uh, can't be any easier than that. 
Great. I mean, uh, uh, communications is an iterative and evolving kind of process for every organization. As you do one thing, you think of other things right. um, to do as well. And, and yes, I agree with that comment that just came in. Great presentation. And we'll be following up. So if there's, Sue, do you have any other last minute? No, just thank you for all us? for staying. Okay. You know, sharing your evening great. with me. <laughs> great, great. Thank you. I